Okay, next speaker is, uh, is Lucas presenting about uh, sensor networks. And I already saw somebody in the room with a nice sensor with him. So, uh, well, good, good to be prepared in this presentation. Lucas? Now test, 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 okay. Once again, hello, my name is Lukas Mozek. I am from Sensor Community. And basically, um, we have the situation, it's like in south of Germany in Stuttgart. There, is, there was the situation like eight years ago where it's thought like, okay, we have news articles in the newspaper that are stating the air quality is not only bad, but it had been compared with like cities in Asia, which have like 20 plus million inhabitants, right? So there was like extreme values. And then as a citizen, what are you thinking? It's like, oh, that is a concern, like um, what to do? I would like to be informed, like the weather forecast, right? So who would agree with me that if you open a weather map, you're making a data-driven decision? Hands up for yes? Yes, okay. So, and this is something you just think it comes, it is everywhere available, right? You open it up, you can see the temperature and, and um, rain. And now I want to make one big difference. The thing is that we, when we observe the weather forecast, we have, of course, the insights. How is the situation now, right? We could look out of the window, something like weather or clouds we can see, we can, we can sense with our human senses, right? But what is important with the weather is like making a decision for now, if you're leaving the house, for example, like how to dress, and what also to expect for the next few hours. That is the change, right? That is the forecast in the future. And how is it done? Is it done on the historical data and also like the uh, current data and how we can analyze it, right? How the institutions analyze it and then provide it. But someone, like how often do you question the weather forecast, right? Not that often. With air quality, it is a different beast because the particles in the air, they are so small, we humans are lacking the senses to identify wherever we are, how the air quality is. Just for comparison, these particles are called particular matter and they have a size of PM10. PM10 is a size that stuck in your lung and has already health impact. And then there is particle 2.5, they're even much smaller, right? They go through the lung into your blood circulation and then when they travel throughout the body, they get in touch with many more organs. That means um, they have an even bigger health impact. And then it goes on, there are even particular matter one, even bigger impact, and then there is ultra fine particles. And now we as citizen, we thought, okay, I have my internet in front of me, I would like not only to read in the newspaper how the situation was six months ago and that it was extreme and toxic, <laughs> I would love to just open a website and see how is the situation now, right? The same mechanism like we have with weather just being applied with air quality. And so you need a data source, right? How to know how the air quality is. So you approach the official entities in your region and you knock on the door and say like very friendly, hi, we have this idea. We would like to present these values on the website to regular citizen, us and others. And then they first say like, no, <laughs> you can't have the data. And then we say like, oh, there, by the way, it's a law, right? <laughs> if it's requested, it would be great if it would be made available. So then they're sending you an email with a PDF, not machine-readable format, <laughs> with values that have been measured six months ago. <laughs> uh, okay, another round of ping-pong of emails and conversations, and you receive new emails with PDFs, not machine-readable format, how the values have been three months ago. So you see where I'm going here? The level of frustration is raising, and the people are thinking like, we need another plan, right? We need another path. We have to measure ourselves because we ended up in a situation where we saw that the official entities back then didn't have an API that is just like handing over what they measure now immediately so we could build a website and inform the people. So we identified online like what is out there and we have some members here, they have these little devices and I can show you one as an example that it's um, the official measurement station for comparison in three categories to explain to you. It's from the size, it's as a shipping size container, right? You see it sometimes at the major routes, standing there and measuring. There is a little pipe watching out and it's a locked up container. And then the thing is, it is very expensive, right? So it costs maybe around like more several cars. <laughs> it wants to place it somewhere and then also to keep it operational and keep the measurements up and running. 
And then the thing is then people just passing by, they don't know what is going on inside, and the thing is like, I never built a computer, I never built a machine, I'm not an engineer, I have no idea what is going on in there. Just they only get the outcome. And here comes the change. The change is the following, that's what we identified back then, that there is like low cost air quality sensors online available that has like this size, right? The size of a palm, like you see. This is the whole device, it has a little ventilator, and here is a 20 centimeter pipe that we are using that goes out of the case and is there that when the ventilator turns on and it sucks in the air, it creates like a harmonization of the airflow that goes inside of the chamber, where is a um, light source, right, and then a detector. That means that everything that passes by, like it flies by, and the light is sent out and detects what comes back as a reflection. And then it can differentiate between like the size of the particles and the amount of the particles. And it goes through the little cable to this little mini computer that just costs two euro fifty. It's a Node MCU 8266. And on the other side, it is connected to an even smaller little sensor, a Bosch BME 280 in that case that is measuring relative humidity, temperature, and pressure at the same moment. So that we have these three values immediately there where the air quality uh, measurements are dying, done. So we know this environment of the sensor, right? This could differentiate, so it's important, it's really good to have these values in addition. And then this little device is opening up a little Wi-Fi, it connects through your home Wi-Fi router, and then on it runs our open source firmware where we send like, hey, there have we have a certain uh, server, virtual server in Frankfurt, sent this value that you have just measured over there, right? All of them, like the particular matter, the air quality, relative humidity, temperature, and pressure. And then once you have measured it, just fall asleep <laughs> for two minutes, right? And then after a certain period of time, a defined period of time, wake up again. It's every two and a half minutes is a new measurement done. And this was the basic idea. So we discovered this, we um, then had a campaign because we thought like we're gonna have 300 of them in our city. Back then there was like the movie 300 Warriors, right? So it was like the activation of local citizen. And then we had the idea to present this uh, on a technical conference of experts and then they showed us like, uh -uh, <laughs> you're crazy, you will never succeed. They have been already EU funded projects, right? With the same idea and what they did is like they failed. None of them like exist anymore, they didn't put it up, and the number 300 is up too much high, right? So it just took us uh, several weeks to have a crowdsourcing campaign. People have only contributed the amount of money that it takes to order these parts. Other contributors ordered it, built it, handed it over back to the people, and they installed it wherever they lived. And they connected to the server infrastructure that was built, and we created a website. And now I will show you the first and last slide from the presentation because this is what it's all about, right? It is maps.sensor.community. We are sensor community and this is maps, right? This is our expectation that we have also like from Google Maps, so we did it like from the naming the same. And this is like the website that we had already from the beginning because we thought like we can give in like Stuttgart where it all started and here you see the city, and it's not only that we had <laughs> very quickly succeeded with the 300 sensors, but currently there is like in around what you see, it should be uh, over 300, yes. So it is like, and this is only one city, and the thing is that from the beginning it was a website where it was describing the four-step process, and let me describe you the four steps. First, we can show it to you, you just go on the website, you go on the guides, you select air quality, and here's four steps. And what we did is that we have this now in 24 languages translated. And the first step is that we only tell the people, please buy this part, right? In Mexico, you have a different electronic part distributor than you have in France or in the Netherlands, so people identify where to get this from. You can buy this online very easily once you typed in the exact um, naming that we tell you here. In the second part, you install the open source firmware that just makes everything alive and tells the device what to do, what to expect that is connected and where to send the end results. And you have here even a flasher, so you can do it automatically. Back in the beginning, you had to, you know, uh, open the terminal, install something, have some commands, push enter. Now it's just like the flasher that you just download, connect, press enter, it's done. 
In the next part, you have to connect the cables between the parts, so everything is like described. People follow just step by step. And in the last one, you just register on the platform, right? And that we know this specific sensor is in Toulouse, and this one is in Stuttgart, and this one is in Utrecht. And um, you are then alive, and you are a piece on the map. And now the numbers. We don't have only 300 sensors. We have 13,000. <laughs> and they are all up and running and alive since over seven years, right? So the thing is that this is a network that measures every two and a half minutes new values for the air quality and the other values that I told you. I can give you the example. For example, we can zoom in. And here at the bottom you see, currently we are displaying the PM 2.5 values with a five minutes average. And so we can switch, for example, to the temperature layer. Here you see it, it's already uploaded. See the differences. Here we have the relative humidity and the pressure layer. And here, for example, we can have also, again, the PM 2.5 with, with the um, uh, color gradient of the WHO. So it looks like this. But this is uh, in an hour average, right? So we calculate it differently because that's how the documentation is telling us to do so. So coming back to the basics, and here what you can do is like with the map, you can zoom in and zoom out. And this is the funny part. Wherever I present this and I show this um, to people on a tablet or a laptop, I never have to ask where they're from. They immediately zoom in and tell me with, okay, they care about their city, right? So it's like, for example, here we are currently in Utrecht. So I zoom in there and here is we have magically some contributors that have built up the setup and they are operational and alive, right? So this is live values. And the network is um, set up in that way that the sensors itself are measuring every two and a half minutes. This is like not like this in the free. It's always stationary and outdoors, but it has a casing, right? So the casing is like a piece of plastic that costs 70 cents. And so you just connect it and it's then protected from rain and air quality, uh, from rain and light. And uh, so you see, these are not only operational, but what we can do is we can zoom in and we have a protection involved included that we cut off the last two digits of the GPS coordinates and then also like we limit how far you can zoom in into the map. And now I will click on this one. That means if it's on the map, if it's a current measurement, the network measures every two and a half minutes, but the map is automatically refreshed every five minutes, right? So if you just hang this up in a school on a screen, uh, and you have uh, locally installed a sensor or several, this will be kept updated every time and then uh, many people are creating even QR codes or when parents are interested in it and passing by, they click on that QR code or URL and then transfer to a local website from a local group or to our website where it's explained what it's about and how to contribute. And now some other functionality is that um, this is the value that is always, here you have the color gradient on the bottom left compared to it, but if I click on one of it, now was the refresh moment, you see a, a table on the bottom opens up and I have the amount of how many sensors are inside of the tile. Here in this case, because I zoomed in already, it's just one. I click on it and now it is capturing the data from the history, right, the archive data, and it's creating with Grafana like this nice overview at the top of the last 24 hours. I see there have been individual peaks, but also drops, so it was not a plateau or a um, a higher value because everything is below 25, so it was absolute in the green, it was fine. And here I have also like the comparison of the last, I think it is six days in that case, and also like with the differentiator between the particular 2.5 and PM10, right? So I can see it. But for example, on this one here, I click inside and that one, it has currently a higher value and we can check how it behaves. Oh, that one is like behaving on a constant rate much higher and something is occurring here and we can identify for how long it is taking, how it um, gets up, but now it's already on the lower end, right? It goes down again. And in a more European wider view, if I check on this, right, much higher value, and I click just randomly in one case, you see then there is like several ones and then I can identify. So people, when they register, they know their IDs. And it is um, very nice because I was on, for example, the Smart City Expo in Barcelona and there was the stand on Bavaria, especially of Munich, and I thought like, hey, maybe they would like to hear about it, that something like that exists. 
And I open, open the website, and then the guy stepped aside from the stand with me and tells me, okay, now I'm not telling, talking with you in my representative role, but as a regular citizen. And then he zooms in into the city and shows me his own sensor, right? <laughs> He's a sensor owner and a contributor. And uh, telling me like that he built not only a sensor for himself, but also for his children and his family, which is in a different city, right? So this is like a very different, nice dynamic. And all of this is only possible because of this contribution of all these volunteers. This is completely voluntarily based, and it is the effort of hundreds and um, thousands of people. So with this 13,000 stations, it is all representing individuals in over 70 countries nowadays. So we have a lot of success stories like people telling us, I'm working at an embassy, Swedish embassy in a country very far abroad, and we installed it, right? Because it, I have one at home, I know how it works. So that's how this idea is traveling. So you see, we are by far exceeding only this, uh, where it started with Stuttgart, because people saw it is on the website, it is four steps, it does it, it do what it says, uh, so it is something they can tell people like their friends and their family and their colleagues. So very quickly, I think it was already in 2018 that we had three and a half thousands of them in five to seven countries. And especially here is to mention, um, now I want to mention a few people that we are thank very thankful because we had like in the beginning the focus on, of course, it's a German local air quality project. But then, for example, Peter from the Netherlands contacted us and he tells us, hey, I'm a former Siemens engineer. I speak German. I was traveling all over Germany, but here I translated it into Dutch, right? Here is the whole website, the whole construction guide. And how about you publish it and put it online because everything is on GitHub. So he just contributed. We uh, clarified, confirmed, and it was alive. And we had an additional language. And language is a game changer in that case, right? So and we had so many support from the community. And currently, we have this guide that is in four steps guide in 24 languages. And that was an acceleration. So this is the result of what you see just now, that we have the success stories in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Poland, in France, in Italy, Bulgaria as well. And these are very unique stories. Each country, when they contacted us, has a different starting point and different dynamic, but all of them succeeded to establish like around 800 sensors plus on a national level, right? And keep it alive for these years, uh, contributing. And in the collection, the whole network itself is generating around 13 million measurements per day. Uh, just in a few days, we're gonna cross, I can show it to you. We have it on the website linked. It is here, so you see like 25 billion uh, data points, right? Measurements, individual measurements. And I must tell you that these numbers are mind blowing for international projects. So we've been at a conference from the UN and they've been like proudly presenting on stage that they had a three years program with 100,000 measurements. And it was like, you know, big data. And it was like, wow, really great success stories. So when I try to um, say hi and showing them what we do and telling them back then we had maybe three or four million measurements per day, it is a few years ago. They thought, I'm crazy. <laughs> they couldn't believe it, right? And then the, the longer we are doing it, the more successful we are, the crazier the story is because the gap between what the official institutions are doing and what we do as a hobby, right? This is one of the hobbies that we operate. And why was this even possible? Because the thing is, they have been, I would even guess, hundreds of local groups trying to establish the same. But over time, they ran out of resources, they ran out of visibility, they ran out of success, of growth, and um, they stopped working, and we are still here. And this is like because the initial members have been always members of several open source groups, right? There is like in uh, Germany, for example, it's nicely to mention uh, the uh, Freifunk initiative, if someone is familiar with it. Or if you know in the Netherlands, it is the TTN network. So they established like Lodavan gateways all over the country. But then they said like to the members, we need something that generates some data and sends it over what we have established. So they picked it up and they said like, hey, it does what it says. It works. Okay, let's connect. Let's send something over. And it uh, is uh, accessible. And um, also very important to mention everything that was ever measured, the whole data set is available as open data in the archive, right? This is historical data. 
everything that is generated now is immediately available through an API. So what comes in from the network, we are giving out, and other people are using this data on a live base. And here, especially when we are in the Netherlands, it's important to mention RIVM. RIVM has been approaching us years ago, and they saw like, hey, we are seeing this. This is like popping up all over the Netherlands. Local groups are created. And they are talking about Zenzo community and this approach. We had a look on it. Is this data accessible? And we said yes. And they have identified uh, the potential of it. And they have created an own data portal, which is called Zamen Meten. I learned this is meant as uh, measured together, right? And what they're doing is that they generating, or like they're using the generated citizen data that they receive through our platform on a national level. And they take it all together and then they make a data fusion. They let it fall together with the official measurement stations. And they found out over the years a way how to process it and how to understand and balance it, right? Because you are not having the mindset of these official institutions where you compare one shipping size container with another shipping size container, but you have 2,000 of these low cost sensors, right, all over in relation to the distance to the shipping size container, and then you have not only one shipping size container, but many of them. So you really like working with a lot of data, and you uh, have to understand how to deal with it. And they become like very professional on that. Of course, they <laughs> are a professional institute, but they are also like very uh, having a very open approach to it, to documenting it, to make it everything public, to make scientific papers about it, having even now not only a Dutch version, but an international website describing all their approaches, being on, profession on um, this, um, conferences and publishing it, like what they're doing with the citizen-generated data. In addition, so it's an addition to their efforts, what they're doing already with their very professional equipment. And this is where we want to go. Like we, from the beginning, this is like our intentions. We are not like, against the official institutions approach. We are like always seeing ourselves as the Lego brick in their bigger castle, right? We want to be standardized, we want to be fitting, we want to contributing to their bigger goals and bigger ideas. And how big these ideas are, I have to mention to you on additional examples. So the thing is that it didn't end just with um, RIVM on a national level, which we have very proudly, we are claiming this as a success story. <laughs> Based on that, we've been invited by UN Habitat, which organized this session, and this took place in the summer of 2020. And it was pandemic time, so it was online. And they have been uh, invites uh, for 32 experts on the highest levels of international organizations, as let me count down. United Nations, WHO, European Environmental Agency, European Commission, Joint Research Center, RIVM, and by the way, also me as a representative of Sensor Community. So these experts have been talking online for two and a half hours related to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, how important it is, especially with the focus on air quality, to have a global wide-reaching network established of low-cost sensors to measure where we can't measure with these shipping size containers because it is too big, too complex, too expensive, and especially not approachable in the sessions where we have um, countries that don't have these resources. And it was not a, a conversation about if, it was not only a conversation about how can we accelerate this, how can we scale this up, how can we roll it out. And it was the first point, and the second point was how important it is to have citizens being involved in this whole, from the beginning because it is like always creating this relation with the official institutions. And here it comes, the most important thing, trust, right? Being open, being transparent about the approach and creating trust. So they had this collaboration in mind and it is like very, something very important. And you can see it, this is like on the international level. And let me show you what happens um, here. For example, we can go on the Sam and Metten platform. You can see it, it's in English described. So that is very nicely from RIVM done because Wherever we are invited on conferences, and I, for example, have been invited to a conference that took place two weeks ago in Germany, and we've been trying since seven years to have once a contact or once a conversation with someone from a German institution. And yeah, we've been waiting since seven years for a response. <laughs> it didn't take place. And then we tried different approaches. So sending out 300 emails to representatives of the parliament, one approach, another one, sending out a lot of requests and emails to everyone that we could identify from these institutions. And then also like uh, from for all different ways through open data experts, open source data. And what was that actually 
one member participated in the Fairmont group. That will be the next slide I will show you. There is a specific under European Commission. There is the Joint Research Center, which is like the technical arm of the European Commission, a few thousand, very well paid, but also very well bright minded. People are working there and they have also their air quality experts. And there is the Fairmont group. And the Fairmont group is especially the forum for air quality modeling. So they are the European experts of all like also RIVM is there, VMM is there, right? And they are meeting there and they're talking like how to deal with this specific topic of air quality, with the modeling. And there is the working group number six where the RIVM people, all the knowledge they have on a national level, they include it in, in this working group and then other entities. And now the Germany begins because we make a journey around Germany. <laughs> it is like Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, right? Italy, France is involved in these activities and we've been trying because after we presented there six years ago we always tried hey maybe a good idea if the german entities would also participate there so over the last few years we made that understanding that whenever we showed up on the stage and gave a presentation like now it was like it goes here in it goes there out it didn't took us serious because who i am i'm not someone representing an institution i'm a citizen right and i'm claiming this is a hobby so what did we do when we've been invited to this conference two weeks ago? We said like, yeah, thank you very much for seeing this importance of this topic. But the thing is that we think in Germany, especially we're gonna have the biggest impact if we let someone from an official institution on stage, right? So then they talked to the people of RIVM and they invited them officially. And it was that a representative of uh, RIVM has been on stage and he Claiming, expressing exactly the same, saying like we are AVM, we have um, Sam and Meten, we are including the data of Zenza community, and uh, we uh, combine it with the official measurement stations and look, here is this and that and that and that, what we are doing with it, and a very nice presentation, and then it happened. After seven years, the official handshake, I was in the room, I saw it, from a German ministry, right, uh, with RIVM, and they saw each other in the eyes and the exchange will take place. They will talk to each other. So <laughs> big hit, big win, <laughs> uh, big relief. And that is a big success story. So here is, um, this is Sam and Metten, right? This is a very nicely explaining what they are doing with the data. And here is this uh, website of the fair mode group with especially the working group number six that has specifically the focus on air quality with this low cost sensors. It's only that there they're doing even more, not only having the whole network on a national level with the low cost sensors combined with the whole uh, of uh, the, in the professional uh, stations is that they also connected with other data silos, right? They, they take satellite data from the Copernicus system, they uh, take um, weather data, transport data, health data, and they already playful with it. They have uh, like very playful approach that they identify different approaches, how to combine it, how to create really um, valuable results. They have a one week long uh, annual conference presenting these results and they are very proud about it and discuss and learn from each other. And it is like a great place where we invite all the other entities in Europe uh, to, to join these activities. And whenever we have the opportunity to be invited on the stage, we are just trying to be, okay, we're stating what we are, but we're trying to be the matchmaker, right? Because we think like what we learned also from the Corona pandemic, and with the application that was open source, right? That actually this level has to be also of like collaboration has to be, uh, is applicable for air quality, right? So it's like why when somebody is doing something great, just stopping at the border because air quality doesn't stop there. The story that I can give you is like, we had been approached by, um, we have been approached by the group in Poland, right? And they said like, we want to roll out this network. I'm born in Poland, I speak the language. So we had a quick connection. We ramped up the knowledge that they have been on our level after a few years and they've been unable to roll this out. And what did they do? They are operational now with all the 800 plus sensors on national level. And then we have been approached by people in Sweden, right? And they said like, we would like to measure the air quality from the Polish people <laughs> because Poland has a lot of coal plants and when the winds are strong, right? <laughs> so you see a line of sensors at the coastline. And um, this is the mindset that people are aware that air quality goes up and it can travel for a longer distance. It is not only a super hot, um, like local issue, and it's not only short term, it can be also over long term. 
But we have here major differences, right? So it's like the official shipping size containers, when they are measuring, they give you out in a definition the focus on the larger particles because there is a European directive, there is a document from 2008, and it says we have the focus on these larger particles, right? Even in the international professional field, there is many more uh, science being done and um, processes already about the smaller particles, the PM 2.5s. So this is why we had the focus on pushing the smaller particles because this is something that is measurable very well with these local sensors. And one more thing also important to, uh, to express that it is not us claiming and saying this is uh, measuring well, it is always us referring to the official institutions and their reports. They do whatever it is, a material institute or if it's JRC, Joint Research Center, or if it's RIVM. What they're doing is they're buying from several companies, right? We have uh, here other examples, they are blue, then we have like also some company has green. This one is like silver and black, they are from different companies, but basically they're doing the same. It's an optical measurement of what is passing by and identifying the size and the amount. And then what they're doing is they're buying a bunch of them from each of these companies and they do three step process. One, you have a testing facility, a chamber which you can lock up and you can control uh, temperature, relative humidity, you put in some uh, of these particles in a controlled environment. And this is also the first step of the process that they're running with this official, in like very expensive devices inside of the chamber and it's side by side, right? You imagine control chamber, several of our sensors, several of these uh, more expensive uh, devices inside, and it's a controlled environment over time, creating measurement points, first point. Second point, they have this installation in the field, in real life, where we installed, for example, a, a couple of our sensors, and side by side, an expert is coming, having the checklist, installing their official measurement station, and additional measurement over time is taking place. And then these official institutions, like Joint Research Center, RFVM, or Material Institute in Stuttgart, is creating a document, right, and stating, here are the measurements, here is the overlap, here is the, how it's behave, how quickly it goes up, how quickly it goes down, how far away is it, how good it is, how bad it is, and how it can be improved. And that's the statement from the institutions, right? So we are always referring to them, and it is crazily, crazily to see in these reports how close this low-cost sensors, like all costs together is 62 euros, right? Material cost of all components is how close it is to this like super expensive devices. But the thing is that we are not asking for a replacement, we are asking for having more of both, more of the official stations, more of the low-cost sensors, and especially more of this collaborational approach that not only one entity is falling all these data sets together and working with it, but they have this like marketplace of exchanging approaches and mindset like it is done in fair mode, but it has to be done more strategically. It has to be done more with like purpose driven. They have to be more resources, right? So we are advocating for that, that these institutions are opening up. And like we said, a couple of weeks ago, we had the success series, more and more of these entities are opening up for this open data of open environmental data approach. So let me, show you also one other example, because I mentioned there is this little sensor and it's measuring this temperature, relative humidity, but also pressure, right? It just came with it, we never thought about it, but we always measure it, we have it in a database, and then we thought like not much of it, but there have been some students and they approached a professor and they told them, hey, a sensor community exists, and they have this data set, and he's like, okay, nice, a quality not fly is so important, but they also have pressure data. <laughs> and then what he created is, there was this um, volcano eruption west of Australia, and it is called Hunga Hapai, or, or Hunga, I think it is the right name, it's like in the top Hunga Hapai, Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai, that is the correct name. And then this visualization has been created, and then the best part about this, that this person, this professor, did two great things. First. This has been published here in observe, observablehq.com, which is like a nice community. And through that visibility, uh, we have been approached by many experts and many visualization data people that have been discovering this. But the most important thing is that everything we publish, we say, um, please use it only whenever you um, make it accessible, publish it just like with OpenStreetMaps. Uh, say OpenStreetMaps contributors, and in our case, then the community contributors, so that everyone is aware 
that this is the source. And we must say 99% of the cases that we are discovering, it's not the case. In this one it is, that's why we're showing it to you. And you see here is like the behavior of this like regular up and downs, but you're gonna see if I forward a little bit, it starts now, right? There you see it. Now you see the wave, and that's the pressure wave that is going across Europe on the other side of the globe, 15 hours, I think it's later, after the volcano eruption, it goes around Europe, right? And it is detected by this little measurement. This is like, it was blowing our minds because it shows the creativity of people when they have a new unique perspective and they bring it like their uh, professional knowledge into it, which we would not discover otherwise. So it is a nice example. And the thing is that uh, we've been made aware by the community, right? They are sending us these links, they are letting us know. Uh, later on, also Hero does a nice email, I want to inform. Uh, this took place and um, the community is always faster than any news. <laughs> this is like an own uh, Twitter, right? So it's like we have ears and eyes everywhere and the community is very active and letting us know about discoveries. And then we found out that um, he, has to, he had to do, he, he, was, um, he, wa he, he did a different presentation, a visualization, because the wave came again and again. Right, it goes around the globe. So uh, another mind-blowing thing, just a quick example of what is possible. But we have so many great uh, males. Uh, for example, one young guy from Australia called us and said, um, I made the first place on a hackathon because I used your data, historical data and the API, and I created not the visualization like you do with the color, but with smileys, right? But I showed that I have the whole stack of knowledge, uh, how to put everything in place, and uh, he made the first place at this, uh, this hackathon. And uh, it is so often that uh, we are at conferences, uh, even if it's like uh, something like Web Summit, even if it's something like Smart City Expo or CBIT, uh, in Hannover Messe. And uh, we just open this up and put it on the table and people are not only coming and having an interest, what is this? But again, they are zooming in into their city and they're showing me their sense idea and they're saying like, this is mine. <laughs> it is mind blowing how many very interested people are already doing this. And also this is like what helped us out because it started in a very local initiative. It was a local project, but uh, only because each time we had reached another level and we've been asking us our questions like how to approach like to scale it up how to make it more automatic the right person entered through the door in the room and with their backgrounds a good example is like um, one person he works at Hewlett Packard Enterprise but he's at such high level that he can't apply what he really likes to do but he loves this project and he contributed code wise right so it was like supporting us because we've been struggling with the server how to set it up differently and he solved it within minutes for us and it is something that everyone that we contacted or been in touch through the project, it is that um, the age, the background, the skill, the gender, it's not how you approach it, it's more that people really like willing the openness to contribute to this. And only this connectivity between other communities and this open mind uh, approach of these people made this possible, right? So this you have to think that is with a run with over seven years with a budget of zero euros. It's not that we have first the money and then we act. It was we had first the problem, we acted upon it, and then we made it possible to continue. How is it possible? I'm always asked the question. So basically, imagine 13,000 times people made the choice to struggle through the internet, identify where to buy these parts, investing the money, sending it over to the electronic part distributors, right? We are not selling it and we don't make the money, we don't have a business model of it, they received random parcels from random companies. Sometimes in the difference during the pandemic, there was shortage on supply chain side, right? Sometimes months later, a box comes up, a strange device shows up, there is not our name in it, right? So they have still to imagine like, which website I have to go? Ah, then the community, okay, then I go to guides on the top, then I select my air quality and then uh, I have to select my right language, right? It's in 24 languages. Let's switch to Dutch, for example, here, right? Thank you, Peter. So, and then they go step to step to put it together, make it work. And every time we have a um, workshop, when we are invited and helping people to make it, all I have to do is to open this up and says like, there are parts on the table and we are not doing this like in the closet. I'm the teacher and I'm going with you step by step, but look, 13,000 people succeeded. Right? They have done it. All they did it is like following this website and building with that parts. 
And the point is that it's very important from the approach. We have only people in the workshop, not that we drag them from the street and we try to motivate them, we try to convince them to do because it's important and it's great activity. We are overwhelmed by people that are already having the interest, that want to build it. They see how important air quality is. Just to mention, there was uh, recently, I think last week even, a new article from The Guardian stating also publicly um, European Environmental Agency expressing in 2021, 500,000 people died in Europe in relation to bad air quality. And of this 500,000 people in 2021, 250 could be saved if we just been uh, following the guidance of the WHO, right? We are not doing this. The WHO released a new, because we are still focusing on a directive that is in 2008, WHO expressed a new suggestion, because it's like a global entity, but it only makes a suggestion. And after the day after, the European Commission had an official online call. Now the process of the recreation is ongoing, right? And we hopefully hope that the new directive will be created in next summer, will be published. And uh, if we would follow the WHO guidance, which we don't count that it will be on that level, it will be something between where we are now and a little bit lower, but not as much as the WHO expresses, um, we could save a lot of lives. Yeah, so I hope I could raise the interest. I could uh, make you understand um, about the dynamics behind it, how it works. Um, ah, okay, mentioned the, the, the money part. Um, so 13,000 people invested the 50, 60 euros. Three years later, three years ago, it costed 50 euros, so it changed a bit, right? The parts became a little bit more expensive. And that's like more than 750,000 euros crowdsourcing campaign without a crowdsourcing platform and therefore without a crowdsourcing platform overhead cost, right? So you can't make it cheaper. And then there is like, of course, this 13 virtual servers in Frankfurt. Uh, that uh, we pay and we joke like, okay, we have uh, one electrical bicycle per year less and so we are also investing time to show up at conferences like here to spread the word and have a few workshops around the world wor year and therefore we have one or two weeks less of holidays. But it's something that we believe in because it visualizes a great dynamic of how many entities without the form of like structure um, really can drive something to some success that is being then taken by other entities and being made even more useful and more visible. So I hope I could give you uh, the idea what an individual is doing on an individual level, right? So contributing, measuring, connecting to some bigger network. Uh, then on a national level, what is being done and proven by RIVM and Samen Metten. On a European level, what is uh, already like succeeding since years in the Joint Research Center, working group number six at Fairmont. And also what is strongly demanded by even like larger entities of the UN that have the focus on air quality and looking for how to roll this out on a more international and scale because you see we are covered quite well in certain countries but even in Europe we have like um, spots that are not covered yet and if we change to America we have certain communities but their local approach. Uh, South Africa we have certain sensors and here it is, right? All the knowledge that is being gained uh, could be uh, applied in Africa <laughs> and Asia as well. That is like a strong hotspot. But here we have certain stations, so here in the bigger cities, of course. So it is looking very diverse. And um, next is like, of course, not only more sensors of that type that we are suggesting, but it also goes into supporting other sensors. The firmware does that. And uh, then also in the future, having the installation that you have maybe two different local sensors and the knowledge of the whole network of hundreds and thousands of this type of sensor from this company and the whole knowledge that you gain with the measurements of hundreds and thousands of sensors of that company is impacting each other and not only them because being at one spot, but also in relation to how far they are of the measurement of the official station, right? You can put them on top of it, so it's really like S uh, spot to spot, or you can measure like how is the distance to it and then also including weather data, which is here of course also available. We can activate the wind player, so you can also see uh, where it comes from, how strong it is, how it's impacting and why is it in certain areas behaving differently. But here currently you see 
Um, in Poland, there is strong like coal burning activities, right? So that is like visible. Here in um, Lombardy, north of Italy, you see it's also because it's the same valley situation. We have it very locally in Stuttgart. It's like a valley. And um, we have here also another hotspots here in the Balkan countries. But it is changing. And like I said, this is like changing goes up and down. So sometimes, like RAVM likes to display uh, when the German Easter fire is taking place, right? So it's coming over the borders and they have a nice visualization and seeing how it is even in this area of Groningen. And uh, back then they didn't have any official stations and they thought like there is also no sense, why should they have even these local sensors deployed? But there was a local campaign and within a few months they had 800 stations installed there. And uh, then they saw like, oh yeah, sometimes it is even, it's a very re windy region because it's close to the coast. They are like uh, kind of hot spots and it's taking over for a couple of days, right? It stays like this. So it is like insights. And uh, coming back to this example with the weather, what is of course going the next? That we have the first entities that going even a step forward and not only looking for how it was until now, how it is now in close to real time, but also how can we express a forward uh, looking expression and saying like, hey, you, especially where you are living, you're living in a hotspot area, uh, for example, on a Thursday afternoon, and how could you behave? How could you change the behavior of your life uh, so you are impacted less by this air quality um, situation? So they are doing already this expression. This is like where it's already ultimately like uh, moving towards. Thank you, great presentation. Thanks. Maybe <laughs> time for one or two short questions. Yeah. You're very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, good. whenever I have the opportunity. Yeah. Um, speaking of the countries that don't have sensors yet, what, uh, what is the maintenance of a center? Can you just build one, bring one to when you're on holiday and just leave it there and, and it will function forever? Or does, the, does it need firmware updates? Is it over the air firmware updates, uh, no problem for that. And uh, maintenance cost is zero. It's only sending the data to us. Whatever it takes is uh, like treated like a Tamagotchi because it needs connectivity, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi signal, and uh, power. The thing yeah. is, whenever a sensor doesn't send us data for 24 hours, an automatic email is sent out mm -hmm. to the person that registered, yeah. uh, just informing you. And we have so many people writing us super nice emails telling us, thank you very much for what you're doing. It is really great my grandmother was vacuum cleaning, she didn't put it back, or mm. we moved to a different location, we mm. are in renovation, we will install it back again. Please, 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 uh, don't kick us. We don't kick the people off, right? Mm. Uh, we, they don't need this clarification, just like if they plug it in again and it connects, it sends again the data and it mm. just follows. Can it be powered by, by solar? Yes, there are already installations that are doing this. A yeah. uh, nice example is like from Wolf SSL, if you know yeah. these people, yeah. they are in Italy. And uh, we met at Fostum and they said like, look, of course I know you. Yeah. <laughs> and he shows me the picture yeah. of his installation. And he said like, my wife doesn't like the cable that goes from the yeah. inside to there. So she forced me to do a yeah. solution with the solar and it running keeps on running since years and okay. he's, uh, he's happy with it. Are there any limitations on where to place it? Like I live on the fourth floor uh, of an apartment uh, building. In is the moment when you register, you let yeah. us know, is it like the side towards the street? Uh, is the back garden side? Is it like the first floor or okay. the third floor? We have people, for example, I understand, in Warsaw, they have like quite a the higher mm. level apartment and they put yeah. it outdoor. Okay. And it is like the additional metadata that is in correlation uh, to the sensor idea. So okay. we have a strict separation, of course, between private data. We first yeah. have a privacy by design approach. So we ask as little as possible, only the mm. email address. But this is even strictly separated after GDPR conform on a different server. And then we have the data itself, the measurements, right, from all the sensors. And then we have also additional mm. metadata. And this is important to understand because many institutions that are working with the air quality data in a professional way, really, like there are <laughs> a mm. dozen European funded projects that work with the data. And then they say like, there is no additional metadata. There is not even GPS data. It's like, mm. uh, when, where is the email that you send us? When did you contact us? Like never. Mm. <laughs> they, they've been working for three years stating it's not possible and uh, never mm. contacting us. It's just like one question and like proven with RIVM, it is possible. I, I sorry, I think we have to, to yeah. stop. Yeah, so <laughs> we, we, we have the drinks. So thank you very much. Thank you A very small much. present from the organization. Thanks, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot.